So uh, let me say welcome to everyone out there. Uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, got a lot of good information from Kirk. And uh, now, now Troy's going to help us figure out how to use it, how to deal with it, how to actually do something live. Um, and he's, he's looking at tools for enabling data science. And specifically, he's going to help us understand RAM stack. And this is interesting for me because it's, it's a new tool set that I haven't used before. Okay, so Troy um, is a statistician, uh, a data scientist from Chicago. Uh, and you're still in Chicago, Troy? Are you based in Chicago? Oh, yeah. Don't okay. get rid of me. Yeah, very good, very good. Uh, Troy got his uh, PhD in statistics and more specifically machine learning from University of um, Illinois in, at Chicago in 2013. Uh, Troy has applied his machine learning expertise across multiple fields um, and, and all of them are fascinating. The vir virology, uh, so viruses, that's a big topic right now. Urban planning, so figuring out what to do with everything that's going on and heliophysics. Uh, which I even looked up just to kind of understand it a little bit myself. Um, so and I don't know if he'll talk about that a little bit, but maybe we, we can go there if we have. Um, Troy is currently uh, working at IBM, great company. Um, and uh, he's also a community volunteer. He's involved in uh, the Pilsen Environmental Rights and Reform Organization. Uh, and he's also part of the Chicago R user group, uh, a great group. I, I wish I could get there more often, um, uh, but I don't, but I do occasionally. And it's always great, great material. Uh, and he's also currently the chairman of the Cook County Green Party. Um, so politics in there as well. I love that. <laughs> so everyone, please welcome Troy. And I see a presentation. This is good. And uh, now we have screen sharing. So we got that going for us. All right. Thank you for that, Roger. I appreciate it. Um, yeah, I have a wide and varied interest. Uh, keep me keep me busy. Uh, the heliophysics was the uh, looking for sunspots, um, using deep learning to look for for uh, solar flares and and the associated sunspots and and uh, trying to predict those. Uh, some work I did with NASA. We won't be getting into that too much today. Um, you know, the RAM stack is. Uh, is what I'm going to be talking about. Um, and it, it's, uh, I think, how all data scientists should should work. Um, and it's, it's a play on the word Jamstack. And I, I guess I'll get into that. So first, yes, I am part of the Chicago R user group. I'm one of the organizers. Um, and we've kind of taken a hiatus. There's been a lot of really good material online uh throughout the pandemic and we're really good at doing in-person stuff um doing stuff online you know when when the pandemic started and we were all trying to figure it out the use our conference went and so we let that one go and, and we've we've mostly been um in hibernation mode but as people get more uh as more people get vaccinated i think we'll be um we'll be we'll be returning to live events hopefully with uh with people vaccinated and, and the, the restrictions opening up, that, that'll be more realistic. Uh, I do work for IBM. I've been there for about four and a half years. Um, it's given me a good opportunity to see a, a bunch of different uh, tools and a, a larger sort of perspective on the field of data science. Um, you know, I did my PhD. I started in 2008 in grad school and finished in 2013. I actually started 2006 in, in grad school and started using R. Um, and just the data science world, as everybody knows, over the last 15 years has blown up. So uh, IBM has given me uh, has given me the opportunity to, to, to see outside of the data science perspective and to a systems administrative perspective in, in, in terms of managing teams, managing big infrastructure, big data science teams, um, and gives me enough time to do all those other extracurriculars that I, that, that uh, Roger uh, talked about. So I appreciate them uh, sponsoring the Chicago R user group and, and via the Chicago R user group being able to sponsor uh, this conference. So um, communication uh, is what, what all this comes down to uh, is 
you know, there's, there's a million and one blog posts about the importance of communication, the importance of communication for data scientists. Um, and you know, why is it important to communicate well? I had to think about this because throughout this pandemic, we've all been doing video, these video conferences, video calls, Zoom fatigue, which I'm sure we'll all have by the end of today, but hopefully not yet. Um, and you know, it's just so uh, fundamental to who and what we are, I feel like, living as digital folks as we are. Um, it sort of gets sort of lost in the background. So you know, I looked this up because I was like, how can I express uh, the importance of communication without it being uh, sort of, let's say, passe or, or without it being um, trite? And, and so I, I found this nice reference from um, a University of Minnesota business school. Uh, and I'll share these slides. They'll probably be posted on my website soon. Um, and so, you know, communication influences your thinking about yourself and others. It, it's, it influences how you learn, um, represents you and your employer. And, and it's a skill that's desired by business and industry. So the, the reason I've been able to do so well at IBM is not only can I do the technical work of, of data science, but I can communicate that well. And I, I typically have to uh, communicate between business stakeholders or our clients, typically C-level executives or, or management, uh, data science managers, um, and communicate what our tools can do, uh, IBM's tools can do for, for their companies. But then I also have to communicate from those, those executives back to our team, our development team at IBM of what those clients want and what those clients need. Um, and sometimes it's a little bit like the, the Henry Ford quote, where if I asked people what they wanted, they would have said, uh, a faster horse, um, instead he gave them a car. So th there's a little bit of that in there as well. So again, it's just so funny. I did a philosophy degree as an undergrad and like, I think therefore I am, I feel like in the, in the 21st century here, um, I communicate therefore I am is, uh, it, you know, it, it, it's so fundamental to who we are. Uh, I, I also mentor students. I mentor uh, some grad students occasionally um, from UIC. I also mentor uh, uh, new hires within IBM. And the career advice, I had to go looking for this. This quote is, if it isn't online, for many purposes, it might not as well exist. And that is... Uh, uh, I, I think it's really great career advice. I had to go back and look it up. It's, I believe, from 1996, like these message boards for physicists who just, they just stopped going to the library, which for some of the younger folks viewing this, um, you know, might not remember looking up the card catalog. That's not a skill that you need to, to have anymore. Uh, and so I think it, it's about being online and, and your online presence, again, in, in this last year of this pandemic. I think that point has been well made. Um, yeah, 2020 and 2021, uh, being online means HTML. And so when I was in grad school, 2006, uh, 2007, all the way to 2013, uh, my website looked like this. This is my advisor, Jiang. Um, and this is his website from that, that's live today, last updated at the beginning of the semester. Um, and it's very simple. It's very, you know, it's just an index.html file. This is how I first learned. Uh, I, I had one of these web pages for, uh, this is his web page, math.uic.edu slash tilde jyang06. Um, it looked like this. And so I, like all good grad students, just copied their, their advisor's uh, website and made it their own. And this is what it looks like. This is the entirety of his, his website. Um, you know, there's, there's some click throughs here, uh, but it, it was nice to, to get this background, but this is not how modern websites are built by and large. Nobody's writing, well, some people are, but most people are not writing just pure HTML. Um, and I think the standardization of that has been around Markdown. Uh, for those who aren't familiar, I, I would be surprised. And you probably use it and don't, if you don't know what Markdown is, you might use it and not know. Uh, it's created by John Gruber and uh, the late Aaron Schwartz, uh, created in 2004. Um, it's appealing to human readers in its source code form. So it's, the source code is plain text, and then it compiles 
typically to HTML. Um, sometimes uh, it compiles to PDFs. Uh, Reddit started using uh, Markdown for its comments. Uh, John, Aaron Schwartz was the co-founder of, of Reddit. Um, so that's where I first became familiar with it. I think I started using Reddit in 2007 or eight, somewhere around there, maybe 2006. Uh, RST blog, uh, I'll talk a little bit about that later, but that's a Python package that compiles um, RST files, which I'm not terribly familiar with, uh, but also markdown files into HTML. So that's a nice blog uh, hosting ability. Again, we'll talk about that later. Slack for the longest time, if you, if you used Markdown, if you used Commented, uh, you could dress up your, your Slack comments in, in, a, in Markdown. And they've since added the more GUI approach to it, which I, I turn off uh, every time if you use Slack. And then, of course, there's our Markdown, which our users might be, uh, should probably be more familiar with. That's now seven years old, which is, which is really mind-blowing to me. Um, for those who aren't familiar with our markdown, this is the code that you have. And actually, let me stop sharing and share my full screen. Uh, where is my full screen here? Uh, advanced, whiteboard, RAM stack, overview, Chrome. I don't see full screen here. All right, well, uh, so here is my uh, our studio uh, IDE, and this is this is the, the code that generates um, that, that's generating the presentation that you were just seeing. And so here's some typical R code, uh, you know, fitting a, a boring linear regression model, and you get some coefficients. And then, you know, here's a new uh, here's a new slide with just three dashes, um, some more markdown. So this is uh, shows that it's a header and then some more code. So let me go back to my presentation. So that is the code that generates this, oh, desktop, here we go. This is much easier. So that, that's the code that generates um, this presentation. And so you can see that, um, yeah, this is the header that I just showed you. This is the, I guess you can see my whole screen now. So you can see the, the correspondence here. So now we have a nice plot that gets automatically generated. Um, the, the, the benefits of this are one, Markdown and our Markdown uh, are plain text files. So you can actually read this. Um, you, you don't need to know HTML to, to, to read it, to have it be human readable. That allows it to be version controlled. So you know if you've ever tried to look at the file format behind JSON or behind uh, Jupyter Notebooks, um, uh, it's kind of hard to version control. GitHub has, has, as of late, added it, but it's not something that's natively there. It's it's dressed up with a lot of uh, with a lot of uh, uh, additional code that you have to parse through. It makes it hard to read. Um, and so when you're going back and looking at disks and saying what changed from this version of the presentation to the next. Uh, it, it's hard. Um, and so what's nice about Markdown and our Markdown is that it allows you to, 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 to have, uh, to allow you to look at your disk and, and keep things in version control. Um, so you know what's changing. Uh, so my teammates can maybe use this. And I, I guess my teammates, let me say that this talk is sponsored by Chicago user group via IBM, but I'm in no way selling IBM products here. Uh, I'm actually have been for some time pushing internally for IBM to, to adapt these into our tools more formally. Um, but my, uh, my weight within the, the company is not so great. Um, and it, it, I heard some, some chatter on, on, the, uh, on the audio. So if anybody wants to interrupt me, go ahead and, and feel free to ask them questions. Um, another benefit of Markdown and our Markdown is that it compiles uh, via Pandoc it's worth looking that up if you're familiar with LaTeX. This will, this compiles, it reads in LaTeX as well, as well. It compiles to a PDF. So if you want to deliver a manual to somebody, that's how a lot of our uh, documentation is created. Um, but it also compiles to HTML. So this is an, these are HTML slides 
uh, using the, the, I believe it's pronounced Sharingan um, uh, program. So this is, this is our markdown compiling to HTML uh, with a, a piece in, in the intermediate, but uh, you can make websites. This is how I host my website. Um, and then lastly, uh, reproducible research. So, you know, the, there's, uh, if, if I, I can deliver you code and data and a presentation, um, and that code will run using the data in that folder. And uh, it, with our fantastic and CRAN's uh, fantastic background um, uh, of, uh, CRAN is just so impeccably maintained that typically uh, you don't need to have, like you see in Python, and not to give them the, the Python versus R for data science holy wars, um, you don't have to have strict versions of like, you need R version 3.7 with uh, package version 1.0.2 to run this. Typically, you can just pull things off of CRAN and it runs and you can reproduce the research. But ours backward compatibility is wonderful. Um, I recently get started doing some deep learning projects with my friends. Uh, and of course, if you wanna do deep learning, um, you should probably use Python. I've, I've been dabbling doing deep learning in R since deep learning existed back in 2012 uh, or 20, 2008 actually. Um, and uh, the, the, you could do it. There's, there's the ecosystem in the community is not quite there in, in my estimation. So I use Python, and I found that I, you know I, I dug in and, and was trying to um, trying to do just some reproduce some examples online, uh, and found that it was really really tough. And is oh no, you have to use uh, this version of Python, and you have to use this version of TensorFlow with this version of NumPy. Um, and it is, it's not anything like what you see in R, where it's just like install that packages, R markdown, install that packages, GLM that, and you can reproduce uh, many of the reports that I've uh, created over the years. Um, and so, so that is something that as an R data scientist, I, I take for granted. Um, if you want to see some of my, so sorry, that's a little bit of a digression that I didn't include in my slides, but if you would like to uh see let me see if i can pull up my my spotify uh if you'd like to hear my my deep learning um project uh this is uh schmacy schmason's top 40 so i i go and uh i i deep faked casey Kaysen's voice uh which i was a big fan of growing up i always listened to it uh, on saturday mornings with my parents in the car going to our bowling league and um and so I deep faked his voice and, and used uh, my tiny Spotify R package to create these uh, Spotify um, Spotify playlists with with uh, with Casey Kaysen's voice that automatically generates and, and that's my my vocal deep fakes. Um, it's fun. I'm, I'm not trying to make any money off of it. Just trying to stay hip with the kids. It's it's a fun re uh, project, but. All that said, uh, reproducing that research was really tough. Um, I had to get a very specific version of NumPy that I found in, in the comments, um, in, in the GitHub issue comments, and it turned out version, uh, I believe it's .19 or 1.19 of, of NumPy has a memory leak in it, and it kept crashing my computer, and, um, so if I were to include that in this in this research, I, I would have to, and I were to recompile it like I just did recompile these slides a minute ago, I would have had to update that to the appropriate NumPy 1.19.2 1 or whatever it is. So uh, this is all uh, sort of built around a framework of literate programming by, uh, is illustrated by Donald News, uh, Knuth. Uh, I, I want to say new, but I think it's pronounced kind of. Um, so he says, let us change our traditional attitude to the construction of programs. Instead of imagining that our main task is to instruct the computer what to do, we concentrate rather on explaining to human beings what we want a computer to do. So again, when you look at the, when you look at this code here, yeah, this is, I'm actually telling the computer to fit a, a linear model. 
uh, and, and, you know, give me these, these coefficients and, and then plot that uh, as well. Um, you know, that's, that's what I'm telling the computer to do, but okay, that's nice. The more important thing is that I'm telling you that, there's there's this linear model with these coefficients and and these plots here. So um, I think that's that's where as as data scientists our our tool our our analyses are no good if nobody looks at them. Uh, I think that's been really well illustrated here as the importance of scientific communication has really come to the fore in the pandemic. Um, really important stuff. So. People ask, what about Jupyter Notebooks? And, and uh, you know, I'm, I, I, I feel like uh, Python data scientists went down sort of a dead end that I tried to communicate really uh, early on to, to IBM. And I, I feel like IBM and the rest of the marketplace has finally caught up. Um, you know, Jupyter, again, is not plain text, which makes it difficult for version control. Again, GitHub has better tools for that, and, and IBM has better tools for that as well. Um, but it's just not natively uh, version controllable to say, okay, you changed this document or you changed this, this notebook. Or what did you change? Um, you know, Markdown and our Markdown compile. So, is, so it runs the code in the background and then, and then that code gets displayed to you. Um, Jupyter, you can run cell one and then skip and run cell three and then go up and run cell two and then you can publish that and it'll look like somebody uh, it'll look like it runs it'll look like it makes sense but or were somebody to go grab that notebook and run it it wouldn't actually compile it wouldn't work as it's supposed to because the author maybe ran the commands out of uh, out of order um, and i've seen that I, i've done that myself giving presentations and, and giving uh tutorials um, and so that's, uh, that, that's why I think people, uh, people have moved away from Jupyter Notebooks and now are onto Jupyter Labs. And I feel like R again, much like CRAN uh, and the rigor, uh, is like the sort of hidden, hidden gem of R. Our markdown has been a hidden gem of R for now, I guess, seven years, but the time has flown by. All right. So Jamstack. What is Jamstack? So let, let's put aside the R reproducible research, these presentations, the, the one that I'm showing you now here. Um, let's put that down and look at the web dev because there's these two parallel uh, ecosystems that, that I think have converged in the last few years. Um, so Jamstack is this uh, notion put together by, um, presented in 2016 at, at a conference by this company Netlify. Uh, they host websites, um, and their engineers were just trying to, to develop some best practices for, for their clients, and they came up with this idea of Jamstack. So it's basically JavaScript, uh, APIs, and markup. So you, you, you take your markup language, in this case, Markdown, which is uh, cleverly titled, but it's, it is a markup language, and you compile that to, uh, you comp you compile that to your HTML. Uh, maybe I'm skipping ahead here. Um, and the idea is to use microservices. So, you know, your, here's your, your browser, your clients, um, and the content delivery network here uh, is what hosts people's website. Um, and so the users uh, write their websites in Markdown. That compiles through Hugo. And, and maybe I have this slide. No, this is the first time I'm giving this talk. So. Um, skipping around here. So the idea is that uh, the, the code, you have your code here, let's say Markdown, human readable, compiles to HTML through say uh, Hugo. So let me go back here. Through hey, Hugo. Troy, just real quick. You've yeah, got, Roger. You've got like a, a box on the right of your screen. Um, it must be like a dialogue. It's not showing. There we go. Up to that point, it hadn't covered anything, but you had some text that was running off, but you're perfect. Uh, okay. Sounds good. Thanks, Roger. Um, so yeah, so we've got our markdown uh, compiles to through a, a static site generator they're called Jekyll or Jekyll or Hugo uh, that compiles to HTML. Um, 
and that's what that's what gets served. And then all the fancy stuff goes in the background. There we go. Who is this? Uh, we've got some more slides, and this is the danger of sharing your whole screen. Um, so let me kill my Slack because I think I'm going to be getting some more messages there. Um, so again, Markdown compiles to HTML that gets served here, uh, and and that goes to your content delivery network. And then all the fancy stuff that you that you would see your shiny apps, those are microservices that get loaded into the client uh, separately. So that's that's the new sort of vision of the Jamstack is you've got Markdown compiles to HTML, and then you've got these microservices that add in the sort of uh, the, the exciting parts of your website. Previously for for web devs, and I'm not a web dev by any means, but I guess I kind of am now with this new stack. Previously, what you would have is you'd have an app server that hosts your uh, that that hosts your apps, that hosts your website, that compiles with your database and a content management system that hosts everything. That goes to a web server, and then that finally gets to somebody's uh, somebody's website. So the idea is that you sort of um, separate out the 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 HTML hosting and the sort of exciting background microservices. And, and this pushes to a GitOps sort of uh, practice or a microservices practice that I got to explore for a couple of years uh, as a, uh, an executive architect uh, looking at Kubernetes and Docker containers and, and this whole sort of microservices architecture. This is more of a monolith style here. And it's very brittle and it's very hard to iterate on. Whereas this is more of a microservices architecture, and if I want to make changes to my uh, website, um, that will uh, uh, it, it, it's it's very fast. I, I make changes, I, I push the Git, and um, those changes go live right away. So, you know, why would people use the Jamstack? It's more secure by separating your your HTML from your microservices that provides you additional security. It's scaled, so. Uh, you know, my, my web server, if one day my website goes viral um, and I have a web server and uh, uh, it, it can fall down if I, if I get, say, more than 10,000 uh, views, but the, the UIC math, uh, a, a UIC web server um, doesn't scale. So if I were to post something that would, would go viral on Reddit, uh, it, it could potentially crash all of um, UIC maths websites, and that's not good. Where is in this container microservices architecture uh, that scales automatically. Um, so if I go viral, everybody gets to see my my viral genius um, performance. It just scale. It, it it loads up faster. You don't have to wait for for the apps to to come up before people can start seeing your website. Uh, so you get better performance, more maintainable. So I'll talk about this a little bit more in the GitOps piece a little bit further. Uh, it's also more portable. So uh, if I want to deploy my website using Netlify's container system, I can do that. If uh, one day uh, my website or my, my startup gets bought out by, say, an IBM, they can take my containers and my portable website that's written in uh, Markdown, that's written uh, using the, the Jamstack ideas and fold it into, their, into IBM's uh, OpenShift or Kubernetes um, ecosystem seamlessly and manage it under IBM and no longer under Netlify. Um, it is the same with my Shiny apps. So if you've used Shiny apps, those are hosted on Shiny. If one day I want to move my Shiny apps, those are, are built on containers as well, and I want to move those underneath another enterprise that's portable as well. Uh, and it's just a better developer experience. I get to work from my R studio. I get to change websites, uh, change my websites, and now I'm managing many because this is very, it's scaled, so it's easy for me to manage multiple websites from my R studio. Um, I can make changes, push those to Git, and everything automatically happens. I'll talk about that a little bit more here. And it uh, leads me into my GitOps slash uh, CICD process. So 
GitOps is the practice of using Git as a single source of truth. And this is from opensource.com article here. Um, they say many enterprises are seeking to move to a GitOps model because it provides a more standardized and governed system uh, that offers flexibility and automation uh, that, that companies desire. So uh, again, uh, if I go and so my, all my code, my markdown uh, compiles to HTML, gets pushed up to a container, then goes live uh, via lots of, uh, a few pieces of automation on Netlify. Um, that exists. If I walk out uh, my door today and get hit by a bus, um, it's not a mystery where, uh, how, my, how my website is organized. It's not a mystery how my apps run, my shiny apps run. That code is in Git um, and, and exists there. Uh, my my computer crashes and I lose my hard drive. I don't lose all my work. It's all in Git, um, and that's how Git ops is. We want to manage. We don't want um, we want Git to be our single source of truth because Git is distributed by nature. So uh, people have my repos on their computers. Uh, should GitHub servers go down, um, that's the glory of Git. Um, and so the, the single source of truth, it's, it's a single source of truth, but Git repos are, are distributed. So it is a really elegant way to, to uh, manage things. If anybody, I'm sure many people here use Git, um, which leads to this. So here's Netlify, and this is their, their Git ops sort of approach, which is, okay, you've got your code. You upload your code to GitHub, uh, some automation that kicks off a webhook from Netlify um, where they recompile your website and, uh, and Netlify uh, will then uh, build a new container is, is what's happening in the background. And, that contain and then they host that container on their website, presumably using Kubernetes or similar tools. Um, and this I pulled off of this uh, Medium blog post. Uh, I highly recommend check checking that out. But then if you, you know, you can have your Netlify dot whatever dot uh, com website, but you can also buy a cheap donate domain name from any domain server. And that's how I have Troy Hernandez dot com. Um, that's how I have, uh, that's how we are going to be using for Pero, the post environmental rights and reform organization. We're doing that just because if we need to make changes to websites, it's, it's a lot easier to do this. So Netlify is not the only company that does this. There's a lot of other companies, um, uh, forestry.com. There's a lot of companies that provide this service uh, with different um, uh, extras added on to people. So that that is GitOps. Um, you know, here's here's the the enterprise version of that, where using Kubernetes. So you you commit your code to GitHub or Git. Um, that gets uh, that sets off a, a rebuild of a Docker container, um, and then I change the configuration on my on my uh, for my Kubernetes to say, hey, we're expecting a new. Uh, I've looked at this new Docker container, um, and w we would like to deploy that into production. Argo CD is the Kubernetes uh, one of the continuous delivery things uh, that looks for that says, hey, um, I'm going to start looking for a new container here. Uh, or when I see a new container, I'm going to deploy it. And if you tell me it's okay to deploy. Now we're going to have that go live in our enterprise. So this is the enterprise version of, of GitOps. This is the, uh, say, uh, entrepreneurial version uh, for folks at, um, in the pandemic who are going entrepreneurial and, and don't want to have all the infrastructure associated with Kubernetes. Um, Kubernetes is not the answer for an entrepreneur. I think folks can use um, uh, their, their laptops and, and web services without having to go to Kubernetes. But once you get to enterprise levels, um, it, it starts to make a lot more sense. And so, which brings me to the, the point of this talk, which is what I'm calling the RAM stack. Um, and, and it's something I'm proposing. Uh, I propose to Mishi, this sort of these ideas, seeing these two, these two frameworks go ahead. So, Jamstack is the way that I think uh, modern web devs want to build websites. And then we have this whole R ecosystem of uh, R, 
doing your data science project. We've got these APIs, uh, Shiny, shinyapps.io, or, or your, there's many ways to deploy those. Um, there's other APIs where you could just hit those APIs uh, with any language you want, uh, like a typical REST a API. There's a lot of tools now. OpenCPU is one I used back in 2015, I want to say. Uh, the first one I used, that, that's JavaScript uh, communicating with R. Um, REST R serves a new high-performance one. And Plumber, which is our studio's version of that, um, these are all tools to do REST APIs. Um, there's Markdown. Uh, R Markdown is how I'm creating these websites. Uh, there's a dependency there upon JavaScript, and, and if you want to go down the dependency rabbit hole, there's um, a, a good uh, website called uh, tinyverse.org, which, which explores that. And they have uh, that, that sort of ecosystem is, is a mini down uh, that doesn't have a JavaScript, but there's, there's uh, our program to generate Markdown, and then that Markdown gener uh, compiles into HTML. Uh, which is what this web, what my websites are, what this presentation is. Um, and this whole framework was put together, or I think established fairly decently. And I think it was actually in response to the Jamstack talk. And if you look at the timelines, that you, you can see they're pretty close. Um, blog down is, I, I believe, in 2015. Um, and it's really a, a great R package for deploying blogs using this framework. And so, why, you know, if the blog down framework already exists, um, why uh, are, am I calling it Ramstack? And one is this reproducible research. Again, um, I, I can't beat that into people's heads enough as, again, I think the pandemic has really illustrated some of these issues. Um, but two, th there's a PR war and uh, PR being Python versus R, but also press uh, public relations. And I, I feel like Python seems to be winning that war in, uh, in uh, online and, and uh, for, for better or worse. R continues to grow and R continues to have record growth. Um, but R was ahead of the curve on this. Uh, you know, like I said, Python users went down this, this rabbit hole or went down this sort of dead end of Jupyter Notebooks. And, and I, I sort of went into the deal, the, the details of why that, that's not a great, um, that, that's not the, my preferred format. Uh, and so I think we, the, these R tools are so elegantly put together by some of the folks at our studio and other, uh, and these Jamstack folks, um, that like R is really ahead of the curve on this. And, and being able to work within your R, within our studio IDE or, Visual Studio or Emacs, and to be able to commit changes to Git and just have that redeploy live to your website, deploy uh, live to your to your shiny apps. Um, that's R is ahead of the curve, and, and I don't think the R users get uh, enough credit for for being um, uh, that uh, forward looking. Um, so that, that is to say, if you want to do deep learning, you should probably use Python. If you want to do deep statistics, you should probably use R. Uh, I, I, I don't like to, to dig too hard into the, the, the holy war there. Um, and so, yeah, again, the, the tools exist, but the, the, the paradigm shift has, has been missed, which is like, yeah, you can use Markdown to create your documentation. And, oh, yeah, you can use our blog down to uh, create your website. But... Um, when you're looking at when when you're looking at communication, uh, as, uh, how I started this talk, uh, is data scientists for their analyses to be meaningful. Uh, you know, if if you do if, if you produce great research in a forest and and nobody's around to see it, did you really produce that research? Um, you know, you have to be able to c communicate those results, and and so you know with these tools that, that I just spent this last 40 minutes going over, uh, as a data scientist working in our studio or, or whatever ID you, you care to work in, um, you are, you can now become a, a web dev. I mean, you're not going to be the world's greatest or most robust web dev, 
but you can create your website. So I guess I, it's probably worthwhile to go to my website. This is built on, um, this is built using blog down. Uh, I, I used a different theme that they use, which required some, uh, a little bit of tweaking and I can share that with you, but you know, here's my blog. Uh, here's the about me section. You can see it's fairly responsive. Um, here's all my posts going back many, many years. I think one that I like, here's that talked about creating Spotify playlists, but uh, this gets into, I guess, all of my uh, uh, side, side hustles, my, my projects. Um, I did this social network analysis of Illinois campaign contributions. And um, and then I, I created this, this social network graph. And this is all Illinois campaign contributions going back a couple of years as of August of 2020, I believe. Um, and you can see that this is a nice little uh, node, uh, uh, node.js um, or D3.js social network graph. This is, so this is Markdown compiled into an HTML with and a shiny app. So shinyapps.io, this is hosted on shiny apps and it, it gets loaded into here. And so this is, I am presenting my research to the world uh, in, in real time. And if I make changes to this, uh, you can see Mike, Mike Manigan and JB Pritzker have a strong relationship there. Um, you know, it's very easy to see. And, and I, I shared this uh, during a campaign and I felt like it was a really effective way to be, to communicate with, with, um, the, the, the broader public as a data scientist. And so now I, uh, you know, as statisticians, we get to play in everybody's backyard. And, and the phrase was, it's a lot easier to teach a statistician virology or heliophysics than it is uh, to teach a virologist statistics, uh, statistics. It's a lot easier to teach a statistician, um, you know, journalism or a little bit of web development than it is to teach a web dev uh, how to do statistics or data science. And so, um, you know, good old, good old meme generator, you know, the, the, I, I feel like the, the intersection of a data scientist and a web dev is this RAM stack. Uh, and so if you want to be an effective communicator and you want, you want to present your results um, uh, in real time and show people that you can, you can contribute to whether it be science or business, or politics or the public good, uh, you can do all this from the comfort of your desktop, your IDE, uh, and, and the, the tools exist. And so, you know, in, in the 21st century where we, uh, where the lines have been blurred between journalists and blogs and Twitter users and data scientists communicating results via Twitter or archive or whatever, uh, I think it's imperative that we teach grad students or other young professionals or old, middle professionals or older professionals uh, like myself, um, then, then it's incumbent upon us to, to present these tools. And, and I haven't done anything great, but I think we need to really, I want to punctuate this paradigm shift that, that's, that's happened, that the, the best web dev tools, the Jamstack, have an equivalent, and so combine them into the RAM stack, and and um, and uh, our data scientists will be a force of nature. And uh, that is that is uh, that is the RAM stack talk. So uh, thanks for your your time and, and attention. And if you have any questions, I'd be happy to hear. All right, great. Thank you so much, Troy. Um, tell you what, I've got I've got a couple of questions that I'll throw out and. Uh, the, the first one is, you know, and you kind of hinted along this, and you gave us a good starting point. But if I wanted to get started um, on this, you know, you know, and, and your website is probably a great source, but is is that the source to go to, or are there other sources? If I want to go after Ramsack, so I, I would say uh, Yi Hui Xie, I think is how his name is pronounced, the author of Blogdown. Um, that that uh, website is blogdown.org, I want to say, or bookdown.org. Uh, I, I would recommend going to that. Um, 
you know, the, the, the idea of the Ram stack is, is really, like I said, a paradigm shift on that or, or sort of presenting a paradigm shift on that. Um, and really saying like, yeah, you can, it's nice to create these little R markdown documents and it's nice to be able to create presentations, but really what we're doing is we're working in Git ops. Uh, we're, we're hosting our, our markdown files in Git. So Git, uh, uh, I would say go to the Jamstack uh, uh, .org, sort of take that down, go to blog down or bookdown.org. Um, it's open source and it's free on the web. I look through that. Um, but the, the, the steps are simple. Get a GitHub account or a GitLab account. Um, open up a repo. Create a, create a blog down website and go from there. That's, that's the, the two simplest cool. ways that I think you could. That's the, the, the two step. All right. So, that, so that's, that's getting started. So then the next thing is, you know, and this is really important. And I know it's out there, but again, just, you know, it, where's the community? Where, you know, so I, I do this, and I, I hit that brick wall, right? I'm trying this, and I don't get it. You know, where's the where's the community at? Is that in for the RAM stack? The community is right here. This is uh, it's it's a notion that I I sort of sort of figured out that like, hey, you know, uh, the R Studio folks are doing a lot of this work, and it's really good work, and I don't want to minimize what they what they're doing. Um, but yeah, this, I, I think some of the renaming of things has uh, has sort of obfuscated that this works is branched off of the Jamstack work and the Jamstack notion. So there's a there's a new Slack group, the Jam uh, a Jamstack Slack group. So go go to Jamstack.org, jump into there. Um, and and that's where you'll find the more if you want to host things if you want to host your website that's where you're going to find that um, if you want to get into the community for blog down uh, Twitter for better or worse is probably where where that is and and, and that the larger R community I think is really taking this up but I don't think the R community has connected the the has, has made the connection again because the renaming of of blog down sort of like, hey, no, this is Jamstack, and they point you to Netlify, but they don't, they don't really punctuate that, that like, there's, there's this whole framework that web devs have created that we, that we have the tools to buy into uh, to sort of join forces with that community. Okay, okay. Um, and then uh, kind of the last one along those lines I have is, okay, what's, you know, and I think I, I've, heard, I've heard it, but I just want to call it out. What's, what's the biggest challenge you know, I would face trying to go down this path. You know, is it this ob obfuscation? Is it this, you know, there, you know, that kind of stuff? Or what, what's going to be my biggest challenge trying to, you know, come up to speed on this? There's a lot, uh, as maybe you took away from uh, from my talk. There's just a lot of little pieces. There, there's that's probably the biggest piece. So there's there's a Git Lab or a GitHub account. You got to do that. There's that step. Then you gotta sort down, sort out the the book down or blog down. You're like, okay, uh, I, I I've okay now I've got my I've got my GitHub account, and now I've got my blog down page that's that's uh, compiling, and I can see it on my local on my local uh, browser, my local host. Um, but I, I how do I deploy that to the larger world? Okay, I can see that on GitHub and there's some there's some work there if you want to host it on GitHub Pages. Uh, there's some work there if you want to host it on Netlify. There's some work there if you want to. There's a lot of work if you want to go down the Kubernetes route and 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 really uh, cause yourself some some headaches. Um, so there's there's just a lot of these little pieces that that connecting uh, the the web hooks between or connecting the hooks between. Git, GitHub or GitLab or any Git server and your RStudio or your IDE. And then there's connecting your GitHub to Netlify or GitHub pages. And um, it just takes patience. The, the, and so there's a lot of infrastructure to set up, but then it, I, I can, 
adamantly say that the payoff is there. The payoff is amazing because again, uh, I have, I have a typo on my blog. I no longer have to like log into WordPress, uh, go find the blog that has that, make the change, commit the change, reload the, the, the browser on my, uh, reload the tab on my browser to make sure the change came through how I expected it to. Like, no, I don't have to do all that. I just pull up my RStudio project, fix my typo, hit get commit, and uh, I'm done. Um, so the, there's a, the, the, biggest, the biggest obstacle is like, man, there's all these little pieces to do, and I don't really see any benefits up front. But then once you get all that infrastructure in place, uh, like if it's push button, and you, I, oh, I fixed my typo, I can go make dinner or play with my kids. Um, and I see uh, Justin Shea put in the comments the uh, bookdown.org, uh, a blog down uh, link, and the jamstack.org link. So I thank him for that. I also put in the tinyverse.org uh, link. So I, I also appreciate that. So thank you, Justin. Okay. <clears throat> and then um, if anybody does have questions, yeah, type them in the chat or the Q&A, and I'll bring, I'll bring those up as well. But I have... I have one that's a little bit more general for you, Troy, given, given you're at IBM, given you got a chance to see all the stuff that's going on in this space, are there any, any tools or things that you've seen that you go like, wow, that's pretty freaking cool, um, and you'd like to call them out, other than, you know, yeah, Ramstack, Jamstack, you know, that, that stuff, right? Um, I, I would say... Uh, the, uh, you know, I love our studio. Um, I, I started using it as a grad student as soon as it came out. Uh, and, you know, I, I'm a big fan of the IDE, I'm less a big fan of, of the, you know, the, the other, the, the tidy verse. Um, but I've, you know, started using Python more, uh, again, for deep learning. Um, I use Python for, Home Assistant, so Home Assistant is fun. I, that's, that's, I think, uh, my last look, it's the 10 most contributed to project on GitHub. Uh, it's written in Python. And so I started looking at other IDEs like Genie or, or uh, Emacs and, and Visual Studio. And um, so I encourage other folks to, to look at other IDEs just to see what's out there and, and maybe think in different ways. Um, but the deep learning stuff is really fun and really exciting. And I'm, I'm, anybody who wants to help uh, grow the R, R deep learning uh, community, I, I'm, uh, that's, I think, my, my projects of the year. But Home Assistant, um, you know, there's a lot of home automation stuff. Everybody's been stuck inside for a long time. And um, the, the problem you see is, it, you know, these devices, uh, ZigBee or Z-Wave, uh, if you're a, a, a data privacy advocate like myself and you don't want to give your, you don't want, I have a ring doorbell on the front of my house and it kind of creeps me out that ring knows when I leave my house every time. And so like, okay, I want to replace that with a camera, but I want all that functionality of the app that that ring provides uh, or that Apple or Google or, or Alexa provides. Um, but I, I want to buy this, this home automation tool that doesn't integrate with Alexa. Um, well, you're kind of you're kind of up a creek then because you you can't you can't use that tool. Well, Home Assistant is an open source uh, alternative to that, and they they create all these nice little APIs that talk to uh, my light switches, talk to Home Assistant, and that talks to my um, that talks to my my Alexa that talks to my stereo. Uh, so if I want to change anything, um, it's all it's all in in Home Assistant. If I want to add something, I don't have to worry about whether Apple or Alexa supports it. Somebody, some nice person, uh, has written a connector to it typically, and um, and so yeah, it's fun. You don't have to worry about your stuff getting bricked if the company that you bought your stuff from ceases to exist. And I've seen this a few times now. Um, people's, if they only have the online account, 
their all their equipment is just broken and, and it's just a brick. Uh, whereas the people who, uh, who set it up via home assistant, their stuff just continues to work like nothing, nothing happened. Um, so that's, that's some fun, fun open source tools that as, as uh, people want to work on IoT, uh, you know, Internet of Things or home automation stuff, it's, it's a lot of fun and a lot of people have been stuck inside. So I, if you need more projects to keep you busy because you already organized your house in Recondo style, then that's... Uh, that, that there's another project for you. <laughs> very good, very good. So we're, we're coming up on time and given we're yapping about data and things, I'll give you one last shot at, is there you know, any last words of wisdom as we're wrapping this up? Um, words of wisdom, uh, learn Git better than I do because it is, it is a very powerful tool. Uh, I, th I think a lot of this is, uh, under the covers of all this, is I saw uh, Reagan, uh, I believe is her name. I look forward to her talk. It was a Git Ops talk. Um, learn Git better than I did because uh, it's it's a valuable tool. Okay. Okay. Great, Troy. Thank you so much for your time and sharing this whole topic. Uh, and, and I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna start looking around and seeing what I can find myself. So. It, Thank you. Very yeah, th much. thanks, Roger. Yeah, join the Chicago our user group Slack. Join the uh, join the the Jamstack Slack, and and we'll continue the conversation there. All right, great, great. Thanks. Thanks, Roger.